joy of, and pleasure um, and distinct honor of introducing our wonderful speaker today. I have a few obligations as a uh, introducer. First, I'd like to ask you to turn on your cell phones. Uh, second, I'd like to thank you for being here at Woodstock. We really appreciate it. We are so proud of Woodstock. And if you're proud of Woodstock, well, I'm going to share with you the people and the foundations who support it. I'd encourage you to help us. And there are buckets as you exit that you could uh, participate in supporting this wonderful free event to the public. So I encourage you to join us uh, helping make Woodstock happen for the future. Um, I would like to uh, go ahead. As you know, Woodstock, Woodstock is entirely run by volunteers. So we're, if you see one, please give them a big thank you. Um, we also are funded by the Dorothy and Jack Byrne Foundation, the Polly Daphne for Children's Fund of the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, the Woodstock Learning Lab, and we particularly thank our media sponsor, the Vermont Standard, uh, Channel 8, WCTV, Woodstock's uh, Community Television, which we love and are fighting to save, uh, Vermont's oldest independent bookstore, our own Vermont Yankee, Woodstock Yankee Bookshop, and Sustainable Woodstock. Uh, so I, uh, anyway, that is the business of the day, and we can move on to uh, the most important business at hand. Madeline Kunin uh, is probably the only author here in Equip Bookstock this year who needs absolutely no introduction to this <laughs> audience. You wouldn't be here if you uh, didn't already know about her. We tend to think about Madeline uh, primarily as a political person, as the ambassador to Switzerland, the deputy secretary uh, under Clinton uh, of education, our governor for six marvelous years, uh, our lieutenant governor, a proud Vermont House member, whip of the House, and as uh, I'm particularly grateful to her now as one of the founders of Emerge, which is training women interested in public service to um, participate in public service, from our school boards, to our boards, to our commissions, uh, right up to serving in the legislature and beyond. Uh, we still need to send a woman to Washington, I will remind you. <laughs> Today we're here to uh, listen to her as an author of her fourth book, Coming of Age. Uh, in addition to being a public servant of great renown, uh, Madeline actually got her master's degree at the Columbia School of Journalism, and she was, has been a journalist and wrote for a number of years at the Burlington Free Press. And so she does this naturally, but uh, Coming of Age is a very different book. I am sure you've all read Pearls Politics and Power, or Pearls in Her Honor. Um, this is a much more personal uh, book, and full of wonderful insights on aging, which we are all doing, whether we like it or not. And uh, I hope you will find it as, uh, as profoundly moving as I have found it. And it's laced with <coughs> wonderful poems and wonderful insights, and red is her color, and boy, I'm thrilled with red as her color, because as you may or may not know, red's my color, even though I'm wearing it today. Um, anyway, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the divine Madeline Cunin. Thank you. I'm going to help you just get up because they're too scared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the warm introduction and the warm welcome you've just yeah, really appreciated. I think Bookstock is marvelous and it's got a tradition and really features authors and uh, everybody has a good time on a wonderful summer day like today. Um, well, sometimes I get asked why I wrote this book. Well, as I get older, and I'm not unique in that, um, I found certain changes happening to me in my body, my mind, my emotions, um, and I wanted to keep track of them. And also, when I changed from a politician and grew into a poet, 
which is a title I really like. Um, in fact, I didn't think I was a poet until somebody actually called me one. It was a fellow poet, so that meant it was for real. But I, uh, I sort of opened a new door on my life um, where I found I could be more vulnerable. You know, as a politician, you sort of cover yourself with mesh, um, so you screen out things that might embarrass you or, or uh, get you into trouble, and you're just more careful with words. But I found that as I turned my mid-70s and 80s, that I was just more forthright. I didn't need that self-defense mechanism anymore. That doesn't mean I let it all spill out. <laughs> um, you still have to have some kind of uh, um, screen to defend yourself, but it's different. I became more of an introvert, and there are not many politicians who are introverts. So um, it was liberating in a way um, to just dig deeper into who I was and what my thinking was. And at some point I felt anxious just before the book came out uh, this past fall. I thought, have I, have I opened myself up too much? Uh, is this dangerous? But then I found out as the book was read that people actually like that part. Um, because there's always a curiosity um, about who somebody really is, and we camouflage that pretty well in our daily life, and certainly in public life. So I wrote about my thoughts on dying, I wrote about having to go to the bathroom very often, uh, uh, the practical things that strike you when you age. But it's not a how-to book. It's just, a, it's just a vignette of both poetry and prose. Well, I'll start with a poem. No longer, no longer will we make love before breakfast. No longer will I dream of seeing New Zealand or the Cape of Good Hope or bears in the wild. No longer will I say yes more than no. No longer will danger sparkle and safety look dull. No longer will I look at my body without comparison between who I was and who I have become, blaming the light for the difference. <laughs> no longer can I toss my hair over my face and count 100 strokes. No longer can I do without night cream and day cream, slathering an ounce after ounce. No longer can I be comfortable sitting in my chair reading for hours without getting up to stretch my arms and legs. No longer can I walk without looking down at my feet to avoid mean cracks and malicious bumps. No longer can I skip downstairs like a girl flying without feeling a thing. No longer can I approach the precipice without swaying against my will. No longer do I think ahead of where I will be in 10 years or 20 or more. Now I think in ones or twos or threes. No longer, but long enough to still hunger for the food of life. No longer do I wish for the next day or the next year to come quickly, like I did the year I turned 10. I want the days to saunter like a leisurely museum stroller who stops now and then to gaze and get closer to the cameras to see the brush strokes and then steps back for the long view before moving on. This is <laughs> the year I turned 80, this is a prose piece, and I might skip around a little bit because it's longer. 
The year I turned 80, the color red invaded my body. My, excuse me, invaded my palate. <laughs> I bought a new red Prius, thinking it might be my last car. Last car sounds like last breath, and I wanted to go out in a blaze. If I hadn't worried about the wind further destroying my hair, my ears, or my eyes, I would have gone for a convertible. I had owned my old Prius for nine years. It was beige, and it blended silently in with the other cars in the parking lot. Sometimes it took me several panicked minutes. It has to be here somewhere to find it in the rows of vehicles. As I pushed my cumbersome shopping cart, I hoped no one would notice that I was lost, or rather, my car was lost. <laughs> my red car would be different, on the alert, happily signaling to me even from a distance. Red signaled to me again, when I decided on the colors and walls and furniture fabrics of Wake Robin, a continuing care retirement community near Burlington. I, I'm sorry, I'm moving around. The move to Wake Robin was a promising time in our lives. My husband had recently come out of a prolonged depression and recovered from a bout of insomnia. We both agreed that the decision to move to Wake Robin had sparked his recovery. We had a plan for our old age. Our children would not be burdened when we reached that dreaded stage of dependence. If one of us died first, the other would not have to cope alone. And we took our own furniture, but then we decided we wanted something new for the, called a cottage and we went shopping for chairs, and we f found this chair we'd like. Together we looked over swatches of material. I didn't want leather. Perhaps leather was a lifetime purchase, and we did not have a lifetime. We did not inquire about warranties. <laughs> <laughs> we looked through books of swatches, lots of colors and a choice of fabric. I spotted a bright red square and stopped. It leapt up at me. I asked John, could we be bold and choose red? Why not, he replied with his agreeable smile. Let's go for the red chairs, John and I agreed. The saleswoman was surprised, and I was pleased to see her reaction. <laughs> We were not the beige, brown, or black leather chair couple as she had expected. In the months, as the months went by waiting for the chairs to arrive, which had been specially ordered from Sweden, I began to have second thoughts. Would they work as I had anticipated, or would they be a disaster? Had we decided too quickly, why hadn't we deliberated longer, given darker colors of chairs a chance. When the chairs arrived, shrink-wrapped in heavy plastic, the two men who unloaded them had to use a knife to release them from bondage. There they stood, two solid walls of red. They're so big, I exclaimed. They look different in the showroom. My husband was dismayed as well. We tried placing one chair in the living room and the other in the study. Better, but not right. My stepdaughter came to fix the computer and sat in one of the chairs. They're comfortable. Really? I asked. Well, John and I had become obsessed with the red chairs. We talked about them over breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> I would look at them before going to bed and again first thing in the morning in, ca in case they looked any better. <laughs> they didn't. Let's stop talking about the chairs, John said, as his insomnia weakened him. Yes, we won't talk about them anymore, I agreed, but it was hard. 
I called the furniture store to ask if we could return them. The owner confessed he'd never sold a red chair before. <laughs> he was polite and didn't want to displease a customer, but clearly he was upset. Keep them until Monday and then tell me what you think, he suggested. Um, my, my son Adam came to dinner with my friend Veronica uh, and he, he I, if you don't like the color, he said, you can get slip covers. His wife had done that with their cat scratch couch. But true, but why slip cover new chairs? I looked at the chairs once more. I asked myself whether I could ever own them. Would I feel comfortable? Or would they always jolt me, make me jumpy on edge? Why hadn't I chosen different colors? with which I'd surrounded myself in the past, silent, relaxing colors that made the living room a calm refuge from the harsh and noisy world outside. Part of me, I realized, no longer wanted a refuge. I wanted to bring life inside, not leave it at the door. And the red chairs did exactly that. They were loud, they were vivid. Day by day, I began to see that they had precisely what I wanted, brilliance. One bright morning, my husband and I arrived at the same decision. Let's keep them. <laughs> this is a short poem called The Bed. They were my sheets and his bed. These are not the right sheets, he said, letting the corner limp down over the edge. Just tuck them in, I said, with a hint of annoyance that he didn't know any better. They always fit on my bed, I said exactly what I thought, knowing I might not be understood or worse, offend. There was a slight grating echo in our words, which we heard in different ways. In other times with other people, it would have shredded the tide that bound them. But in this time with the two of us, the tear was so quickly rewoven that we looked at each other and laughed. My husband died about a year and a half ago. And we were, it was a second marriage for both of us. This is a poem called, I loved you when you did the dishes. <laughs> I, I cooked, you did the dishes. Did I love you for that? I listened to the distant clattering in the kitchen while I sat in my chair reading the newspaper. We shared most tasks then. But you did the driving and I could sit still by your side with only a rare glance in the rear view mirror to check if it was safe to pass. Now I do everything, cook and wash the pots and meet the dishwasher's greedy demands. I make the bed which you once made when we slept together. I push your wheelchair and straighten my back, not letting it sink into a stoop before it's time. I feel my muscles tighten up the incline. I wish you could feel it too from your glued position. You need me now to move in any direction, up and down and around corners without bumping into things like winter boots thrown casually on the floor. I take the lead, pulling you out of yourself and into the world I inhabit. You visit me from time to time like you used to do when you did the dishes and the counters always needed wiping. This evening is better than this morning when you berated yourself for growing old. What can I do, you ask, pleading with yourself? I whispered, nothing. Evenings we meet on the sofa and talk about a story in the New York Times or a scene from the evening news. 
We are same-minded again. The world is spinning crazily out of its orbit. We shake our heads from side to side in rhythmic disbelief. I reach for your still hand, cover it with mine, and keep it there. This is a slightly grim one. It's part of a nightmare. It's called Teeth. I spit them out like olive pits, tainted, yellow, and hard, uprooted from the cave of my cheek where my tongue fingers empty rooms. I contort my smile to hide the hag I have become. My tongue takes measurements in and out, back and forth. My lids seek light. I open wide, one tooth hanging on the edge of a cliff, another set in a tub of space where it may wobble and lose balance. I panic at the thought. I must bear my teeth in self-defense. I must chop my way into old age. Ah, uh, I smile and open wide and lift my electric toothbrush off its solid base and brush and brush and brush. <laughs> You're so kind. <laughs> um. Sorry. This is a short prose piece. I could be the oldest person in the audience, but so what? Uh, my age drops to the floor and I step on it with my dancing feet. Mavis Staples is shaped like a muffin, dressed in a swishy black top and matching in swinging black silk pants. Her hair is like a blonde bowl, it sparkles. She's escorted on, change, on stage by the hand of a dark-suited assistant. She needs help, but when the band turns to jive, she rolls across the stage like a loose marble. Her shoulders pump up and down to the music, her arms are swinging, and her feet kick off gravity. When she opens her, out, her mouth and out it comes, a powerful voice that blasts into the crowd, She's got it, they clap. She's still got it. How old is she, I asked the woman sitting next to me who seems to know all the songs. I don't know, she replies. I guess. Mavis tells the audience that the staple singers have been singing for 65 years. Let's see, 80 or 85, maybe? I'm so excited, Mavis exclaims more than once between songs. She is outrageously happy. Then she pauses, spots a familiar face in the audience, and reaches down. He jumps on the stage, tall, dressed in white pants and jacket, with lanky long hair. He runs to her side and hugs her. They sing a song or two together, and then they dance. Did you see me dance? She coquettishly asks the audience. I almost fell down, but he held me up. I clap in the crowd, moving my feet and shoulders, trying to keep up. The crowd hoots and hollers. I release my voice. I shout, surprising myself. When the guitarist, the bass guitarist has a solo, he bends his body in like a straw. He holds his instrument in a lover's embrace. He makes it sing in a high-pitched voice, a voice so beautiful, so plaintive, like the singing of a loon. The drummer has his turn. He builds up the sound to a mad tempo, like jazz drummers do. But this time, perhaps because his hair is white, I pound the drums with him. I allow myself to drum the hell out of those drums. It feels so good. I am not old. I'll conclude by um, 
reading a poem called A Love Poem. And um, I'm going to, um, the publisher asked me to write, write a book of poetry, so I'm writing more poems since then. Um, a Love Poem. Uh, the way the arrangement was at Wake Robin, you could go through different stages of independent living and skilled nursing and so on. So I was in independent living and John was in skilled nursing. Each night I wheel you to your door with a kiss on your lips. I smile, my love, at you generously, I think. You don't know how much I love you, you say. I do, I do. We formed a ritual of waving goodbye as I retreat slowly down the hall. At first I wave with one hand in the air and then my arms go wild before I turn the corner as if struck by a storm or signaling for help. We wave in tandem, you are there and I am here. The nurses now know we wave not for them, but for one another, to have and to hold the love we swore to once and forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sicily with two friends who were artists 
and they they made art. Uh, we all sat together at a big table, and I wrote poems. And I just found it stimulating to be with other people who were working. I think you can't wait for the muse to descend um, and sit on your shoulder and say, go. <coughs> um, when you actually do sit down, something happens. Uh, you may rewrite it. You probably will rewrite it. Um, but I think a certain amount of discipline is necessary to say, I'm going to do this for these many hours. Uh, I have an office at UBM, uh, which I haven't been to this summer, where I wrote a lot of my books there. Um, and it was a good space, because uh, there were no interruptions and no call from the dishwasher saying it has to be empty. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was good. There's a question over here. Uh, I had a very similar question, oh. so she's just answered it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Over here. Yeah, in the back. I have a comment. I'm a new resident. Could you stand up so we can Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're a bit tight in here. My name is Sebastian. Hello. I'm a new resident of Woodstock. Uh, I, uh, I just, I have a comment. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing your courageous vulnerability and the artistic side of public service. So thank you so very much because you're incredible. What an amazing woman. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for saying that. It, uh, I'll try. I wish I could record it so I could play it. <laughs> <laughs> it is recorded. It's recorded. Really yeah. I'm Ellen. I'm a teacher at Woodstock High School. Um, I have a question for Ellen. My heart sort of. Can you jumped. speak a little louder? My heart jumped when you said at Wake Robin that there came a time when you had to be in separate rooms from your husband. Was that difficult for you to be in a separate place? Yes. <laughs> but I was also grateful that it wasn't far away. I mean, it was in the same, about, uh, almost the same building. It took me four minutes to get there. So I was very fortunate in that. And. Uh, so we still could eat together and do things together. Um, and that's one of the advantages of an arrangement like that. I think it's pretty much harder for other people who have to go to nursing homes or um, other situations. And we still communicated. So that was important. Yeah. There was a question here. My comment is just, I might have shared Brie, I just want to say, say thank you for letting you, that you share your life and how incredible your chapters have been. And it just gives us hope as we go through our own stages of life to see how you've evolved and the, and the doors that you've opened and how true that can be for all of us. And so I thank you for sharing that story because it's, we all know how wonderful you are. And now having to be a poet on top of everything else just makes sense. Each of us think, okay, maybe I can try something. <laughs> so thank you for that. Well, thank you. I feel very fortunate, too. Um, I mean, you experience a lot of loss when you grow older. So it's nice to make a new discovery that adds another chapter to your life. And that a lot of people actually resonate with as as they go through their own their own I don't know if development is the right word but their own evolution. I like that one. Oh. I know, it's a hard question to answer. Yes. Um, Did everybody hear? What's your proudest accomplishment? Well, in, in, 
in politics are probably, you know, there are lots of definitions of power. And when you're in a position of power, like governor or ambassador, um, you can make decisions which affect other people. And the most comfortable definition of power that I've enunciated is, is the power to empower others. And I guess my most long-term contribution would be enabling more women to save it, serving my mentoring, being a role model, not really conscious of that, but that's... Thunder, my God. All right, stop. <laughs> And on a personal level, my, my children, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. That was well done. That was Thank great. you. That was nice, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was lovely.